So let tonight. Hi everyone. Hello. I hope everybody had an amazing week and an amazing day today. Um, I just want to take a few moments of your time and share something with you. Okay. Um, during the Pro Providence Mountain Ministries and Kingdom General Prophetic Conference on 9-21-24, one of the prophetic words that was released of our household of faith was that the glory of the Lord will be increased in this ministry. God is about to pour out an increased portion of his glory over this house. Later on, I then had an experience with the Holy Spirit where I felt the coolness of the glory of the Lord in the place manifested his presence and his glory. I then started to smell fruits. I couldn't identify the types of fruits. However, my spirit perceived it as the fruit of the spirit, which was released in this place. So mm -hmm. as the conference went on, I started to think to myself, if God was about to pour out his glory over us, our yeah. containers need to have the capacity to carry his glory in the season. We can't be old wine skins trying to carry this new wine, which is the increased glory of God in the season. Yeah. Our characters need to be intact. Since the fruit of the spirit represents the characters of God, and since we are believers and we have the gift of the Holy Spirit within us, we are able to walk and manifest these character traits, not through our own abilities, but by the abilities which the Spirit gives us. Don't worry if you're in this Bible study and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You will have an opportunity to accept his free gift of salvation and have access to the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So when Bishop asked me to teach Bible study this week, I decided to teach from my own personal study, which is, is my character good enough to house the glory of God? Am I truly walking in the fruit of the Spirit? Now, the fruit of the Spirit is a biblical term which refers to the characteristics produced in the life of a believer who is living by the Holy Spirit. These qualities are listed in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, which states, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. This is the NIV version. The ninth fruit of the spirit is love, namely the agape love, which is an unconditional, sacrificial love for others and is reflecting God's love. Joy, which is a deep sense of gladness and delight that comes from being in communion with God, regardless of our external circumstances. Peace, which is the inner tranquility and calmness that results from trusting God and being reconciled to him. Patience, which is endurance, long suffering, and the ability to remain calm in the face of challenges or delays. Kindness, which is tenderness, compassion, and benevolence towards others. Goodness, moral integrity, virtue, and active doing good for others. Faithfulness is loyalty, reliability, steadfastness in one's relationship with God and others. Gentleness is humility and consideration in dealing with others, avoiding harshness or force. And finally, self-control, which is the discipline and the ability to control one's desires, emotions, and actions. These fruits are seen as evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in a believer's life transforming them to reflect Christ's characters and live in alignment with God's will. Amen. Today, we will examine the fruit of love. I chose this not only because it's the first fruit mentioned in the, of the nine, but love is the most crucial character trait of all. 
Um, maybe in your spare time or Bishop, maybe we could do a Bible study series examining the rest of the eight fruits depend uh, in developing our character so that when God uh, pours his glory over our house, we will be ready to carry it. Just a side note, okay? When we think of love, each person interprets the world differently based on our personal experience with love. Whether our experience of love was performing based quid pro quo, brotherly love, et cetera. We need to understand the kind of love God wants us to have. But before we do, I feel led to pray right here. Abba, in the mighty name of Jesus, we are your sons and daughters, and we are coming to you to heal our heart and our hurt from our experiences from the wrong type of love. Heal every broken heart right now in the mighty name of Jesus so that our hearts can be open to and carry your agape love to demonstrate it to others. And it's through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. All right. So let's first examine the types of loves there are. The concept of love has been deeply explored in various cultures and languages with the ancient Greeks famously identifying four types of love. Each captures different aspects of the human experience of love. Here's a breakdown of the various types of love. First is agape. The definition of agape is it's a selfless, sacrificial, and unconditional love. It's the highest form of love, often associated with divine love, God's love for humanity. The characteristics of this love is that it's enduring, it's based on merit, it's not based on merit or emotion. It is given freely without expecting anything in return. Examples of agape love is God's love for humanity, as seen in John 3, 16, and love for all people, including strangers or enemies, as seen in Matthew 5, 44. The other kind of love is philia, and the definition of philia is a deep friendship or affectionate love, often seen between close friends. It involves mutual respect, shared values, and an emotional connection. Characteristics of a filial love is it's reciprocal, it's built on trust and loyalty, and often grows stronger over time through shared experiences. Example of this type of love is seen between David and Jonathan in the Bible. We can read about their story in 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 3, as well as close friendships or the love shared within a, a, a strong community. Storge, the definition of this love is the love that exists between family members, especially the natural bond between parents and children. The characteristic of Storge love is that it's protective, it's nurturing, and it's often unconditional. It may not be as passionate or intense as the other types of love, but it's foundational and enduring. Examples of this is the love parents have for their children, as seen in Ephesians 6, 4, and the love between siblings or other family members. The fourth type is eros, and this is a romantic or passionate love, often characterized by desires, attraction, or emotional intensity. Characteristics of this love is that this love is often associated with physical affection, romance, and longing for a connection. While eras can be fulfilling, it also can be fleeting, if not combined with the other forms of love like philia or agape. Examples of, um, of uh, eros is the romantic relationship or marriage. We can see evidence of that in the Songs of Solomon and the attraction between partners. In addition to these classical types of love, modern psychology and philosophy has explored further dimensions of love leading to the identification of other types. They have ludus, which is a playful and a flirtous 
uh, flirtatious and a fun type of love, often seen in the early stages of a romantic relationship. <laughs> that characteristic is that it's lighthearted, not deeply serious, and it involves teasing, laughter, and a sense of excitement. Examples are playful flirting and casual dating without a deep commitment. Pragma is also a practical, long-lasting love that develops over time. It's rooted in commitment, understanding, and a long-term perspective. Characteristic of pragma love is more about effort, compromise, and shared goal rather than passion or attraction. It often evolves in long-term marriages or partnerships. Examples are like with long-term marriages, where the love has matured over decades, or couples who support and understand each other deeply beyond the initial attraction. The other one is called philosha, philosha which is the self-love. It's the love of oneself. It has both positive and negative connotation, depending on how it's expressed. A healthy philosha is a positive form of self-love that involves self-compassion, self-respect, and a balanced self of self-worth. Unhealthy philosophy or narcissism is an excessive or selfish form of self-love often resulting in arrogance or vanity. Examples of philosophy is practicing self-care and valuing oneself without being self-centered, or learning to love yourself in a balanced and healthy way, as Mark 12, 31 tells us to love your neighbor as yourself. And the final one is compassionate love, which is a deep emotional connection without the intensity of passion, often found in long-term friendship or partnership. It is rooted in intimacy, shared life experience and emotional bonds that provide comfort and stability. Examples of this love is a love between close friends who are like family, long-term couples who, whose relationship is based on friendship, loyalty, and trust rather than passion. But by understanding these various types of love, we can better navigate our relationship ensuring that we offer the right type of love in different situations in the areas of life. Now, the two greatest commandments given by God as taught by Jesus in the Bible are found in the New Testament. Matthew 22, 37 through 40, it says, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Jesus said that this is the first and greatest commandment. It calls for total devotion to God, encompassing one's entire beings, emotion, thought, and will. It is found in Matthew uh, 22, 37, 38, where Jesus quotes from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, 5. The second is found in Matthew twenty two thirty nine. 39, where he tells us to love your neighbor as yourself. It emphasizes the importance of loving others selflessly, just as one cares for and respects oneself. This commandment highlights the significance of compassion, empathy, and kindness in human relationship. Jesus concludes by saying that all the laws and the prophets hang on these two commandments in Matthew, as we saw, see in Matthew twenty-two forty, 40, meaning that these two commandments summarize the essence of God's will as revealed in scriptures, which is the love for God and the love for others are the foundation for all moral and ethical living. Now, the types of love that are reflected in these two great commandments represent profound forms of love that goes beyond feelings and into commitments, selflessness, and devotion. They are one, the, uh, the, the command is the agape love, the command to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, 
reflects the agape love of God, which is the highest form of love in Christian theology. Agape, as we said, was unconditional. It's selfless and sacrificial. It's not based on emotions or feelings, but on conscious commitment to God, encompassing the whole person, the heart, which houses our emotions, the soul, which houses our spirit, and the mind, which houses our intellect. Agape love for God is about total devotion and the desire to please him in every aspect of our life. It means putting God first, trusting in his will, and living in a way that reflects his character. And this type of love is unwavering when circumstances are difficult or understanding is limited. The second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, reflects the filial love which is often described as a brotherly type of love or deep friendship. It involves caring for others, treating them with kindness, compassion, and respect, just as you would want for yourself. Amen? This kind of love also involves empathy and active goodwill, which means it goes beyond the surface level interactions to meet the needs of others, to support them in the time of trouble, and to show general care and concern. Loving your neighbors as yourself requires humility, putting others' needs on par with our own, and being willing to serve without expecting anything in return. Filial love is a practical and a relational uh, love. It's manifested through actions like helping others, being patient, forgiving, and also showing generosity. The third type of love is the self-love in a proper balance, you know, where the, the phrase says, as yourself, it implies the healthy self um, sense of self-love, not the selfish or prideful way. But in a balanced way, it reflects self-respect, dignity, and care for one's own well-being. To love others as yourself means to treat them with the same respect and care that you would want. This balanced self-love creates foundation for the understanding of the needs and the values of others. Without it, loving others will become difficult as your cause call to treat others with the same regard and kindness you would apply to your own life. Now let's examine the character of God's love, which is agape love. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 13. Um, I'm reading from the New International Version. It says, if I speak in tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecy, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in the part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought, thought like a child. I reasoned as a child. When I became a man, I put away childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully that even as I'm fully known. 
Now these are three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of all this is love. Amen. This chapter is often referred as the love chapter. The passage in the New Testament provides a poetic uh, description of love. Here's a breakdown of its contents. Now let's look at the who, what, why, when, and where of the scripture. Who? The author of this um, scripture was the Apostle Paul. He wrote this as a letter to the Christians in Corinth. The recipients of this letter was the Church of Corinth, which was a diverse group of early Christians in the city of Corinth, which was a significant trade hub in the ancient Greece. What is this chapter about? The chapter is about love, especially the agape love of God, which is the selfless, unconditional love. Paul outlines these qualities of love and its supreme importance above spiritual gifts like prophecy, knowledge, and faith. It emphasized that love is essential foundation for Christian living and community. Where Paul uh, wrote 1 Corinthians while he was in Ephesus, addressing the issues occurring in the Christian community in current Greece. Corinth was known for its wealth, immorality, and various religious practices. And this letter addresses the moral and spiritual challenges within this current church. When was this letter written? It was written about AD 53 through 55 during Paul's third missionary journey. Why did Paul write this letter? He wrote this chapter to address the divisions and the misunderstandings within the current church. There was a lack of love and unity among the believers, particularly regarding the issues of spiritual gifts and their understanding of what it means to live as Christians. Paul wanted to remind them that love was more important than any gift or status in Christian community. Amen. So this passage describes love as being patient, kind, not envious or boastful, not arrogant, nor rude, nor self-seeking or easily angered. Love rejoices with truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hope all things, and endures all things. Ultimately, Paul teaches that love never fails and greater than faith and hope. As we refine our character in the area of love, especially in agape love, the Bible speaks about agape love, which is known as God's selfless and unconditional sacrificial love in several key passages. Here are some significant ones. If you want to write these down so you can write them out and post them around your home as you commit them to memory. They are John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This verse demonstrates God's agape love for humanity as he gave his son Jesus Christ to save the world. The second one is 1 John 4, 7 and 8, which says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and who, whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. This passage highlights that God is the source of love, and knowing God means embodying his love and how we treat others. Another scripture is Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us, while we were still sinners, Christ dies for us. God agape love is shown through Christ's sacrificial death on the cross, even when humanity was undeserving. Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, which we read earlier, and through this passage, which is often read during marriages, is a description of human love, which also mirrors 
agape love of God. And it, it described loves as being patient, kind, not self-seeking, and never fails. Another favorite scripture is Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ when we were dead in transgression. It is by grace that you have been saved. Here, God's love is described as merciful and life-giving, showing his deep compassionate compassion for humanity. Another one is 1 John 4, 9 through 10. This is how God showed his love among us, he sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. This passage emphasized that God's love initiates salvations for us even before we loved him. And finally, Romans 8, 38 through 9. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor present, nor future, nor any powers, nor height, nor death, or nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. God love here is portrayed as unbreakable, eternal, unchangeable through Christ. Now, these passages reflect the depth and consistency of agape love, demonstrating God's unconditional and everlasting commitment to humanity. Now, let's make look how to make love, the agape love of God, more relevant in our life. I want to make this practical since we are strengthening our character trait of love. I would like to offer a few suggestions and if you're already practicing these suggestions, please continue to do so since we are all his ambassadors here on the earth. Now, strengthening the practice of agape love, which is the unconditional selfless love that reflects God's love, as you see, I'm repeating it because I want to get it into your spirit, requires intentional growth in how you relate to others and align in your life with Christ's teachings. Here are some several ways to deepen the practice of agape love in your daily life. First, you can develop a deeper relationship with God. Agape love originates from God. The more we experience his love for us, the more we are equipped to be to extend it to others, amen? We can spend time in prayer and reflection, regularly seeking God's presence, asking to fill us up with his love and to guide our actions. Studying the scripture, meditate on the passages of love like Corinthians 1.13, John 15, 1 John 4, and the others that I shared is understanding how Jesus modeled agape love can help us how to apply it in our lives. Abiding in Christ. Jesus said in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. So we need to stay connected to Christ through daily devotion, which will empower us to love like him. Another way that we can develop and strengthen love in our life is cultivate humility and selflessness. Unfortunately, we live in a society that operates in quid pro quo, which in Latin literally means something for something. Agape love is characterized by putting others before yourself, seeking their good without expecting anything in return. We can serve others without seeking recognition, look for opportunities to help those in need, whether in our family, church, or community. Jesus demonstrated this by serving, washing his disciples' feet, and sacrificing his life for us. Also, another way to practice this is practicing forgiveness. Agape love forgives freely and repeatedly, even when it's difficult. Work on letting it go of grudges and offering grace. Remember how God forgives you. Being patient and, and kind as 1 Corinthians 
13, 4 says, love is patient, love is kind. Practice patience in difficult situations and choose kindness even when it's not reciprocated. Um, also, we can choose to love in difficult situations. Loving those who love us back is very easy, but agape love challenges you to love in difficult circumstances. I want to be hot right now, which means humble, open, and transparent. When I'm challenged to love someone in a difficult situation, I look over my life and see how God loved me despite of my unlovable moments. And it's through my own experience with the love of God that I can find grace for others. Does that make sense? Amen. Loving our, your enemies. Jesus taught us in Matthew 5, 44, for us to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who hurt you or oppose you and strive to, and strive to show them compassion even when it's not deserved. Respond with grace during uh, conflict. When you're in disagreements or facing with negativity, respond calmly and respectfully, looking for ways to bring peace and understanding instead of escalating in a situation. Help me, Holy Spirit. <laughs> um, another place is to seek to understand others. Agape love involves deep empathy and understanding. It requires us to see beyond ourselves and to genuinely care for the well-being of others. Practice active listening. This is listening to others without judgment, trying to understand their perspective and emotions. This can help you to show love by addressing their true needs and concerns. As a psych nurse, this is where I am I'm operating on a daily basis. Be slow to anger. Work on controlling your emotions when conflict arrives, as James 1.19 tells us. Respond thoughtfully and lovingly rather than with frustration can definitely transform relationships. Act with generosity. Agape love is sacrificial, which often requires giving of yourself, your time, resources, or attention. Give freely, whether it's financial support, give of our, our time to help someone, or offering our skills. Generosity is a key aspect of agape love. Remember, God loves a cheerful giver, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Invest in others' lives. Sacrifice your personal comfort to be there for others. Show up for people during difficult times. Offer encouragement. Help them to grow in their faith as well as their well-being. Love through small acts of kindness. Agape love doesn't have to be a grand gesture. It often shines through with small daily actions that reflects God's love. Perform random acts of kindness. Be intentional in doing small and thoughtful things for others, writing encouraging notes, helping someone with a task, or offering a listening ear. Speak words of encouragement. Build others up with our words. You know, to, you know, often in society, we tend to tear others down so that we can look good. Let's build others up with our words. Offer genuine compliments or affirmations that can lift someone's spirit. Be consistent and persistent. Agape love is a continuous choice even when it's difficult. It is unconditional, meaning it doesn't waver based on circumstances. We do this by being persevering love. Don't give up on loving people, even when they don't reciprocate or when you face challenges. Agape love endures all things. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Commit to practicing love daily. Make a daily decision to love each other intentionally. Set small, specific goals for how you can practice love in our relationships. Seek accountability and support. 
You don't have to do it alone. Surround yourself with people who will encourage and challenge you to grow in agape love. Join a community, small groups, the different ministries we have here, singles ministry, marriage ministry, a group of friends, you know, being a part of a small group where you can openly discuss your challenges and share, share your progress in practicing agape love will help you stay focused. Ask for feedback. Invite trusted friends or family to give you the feedback on how you're showing love and being open to growth. Pray for more love. Ask God to develop agape love in our heart. Pray for the ability to love others like Christ did. Ask God to help us to see others the way he sees them and to fill our heart with his compassion. Amen. Also pray for the strength to love in difficult times. In times of trial or when you're struggling with people, rely on prayer to help you continue loving. Now by intentionally working on these areas, we will strengthen the practice of agape love in our life, becoming more Christ-like on how we, we love like God and others and even ourselves. Over the past week, the sermons that have been preached have encouraged us to get in the right posture of sonship, not servants, the reconciliation of families, both church and personal, getting our house in order, AGI, which is the agreement, generational blessing and identity, where is your faith, and why would God grant a satanic request? all have been ordained from the Lord as a way of preparing us for what to come. We all know the famous parable about the 10 virgins, the five wise and the five foolish virgins as seen in Matthew 25, one through 13. Let's make the conscious decision to become like the five wise virgins. And I'm gonna take some creative license here by getting our character in line for the great outpouring of God's glory over us. Amen. As Prophet Chantel told us back on 9824, we need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. As we go through the fruits of the Spirit, allow the Lord to help with the help of the Holy Spirit to develop these character traits fully in us. That so that we, his vessel, will have the capacity to carry the outpouring of his glory in this season. Amen. Now, before I close, I would also like to take another creative license with Acts 1 and 8, which states, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the world. This is the NIV version. I'm using this verse in context with the fruit of the Spirit, starting with love, which can be applied to our personal life and relationship by drawing parallels between Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the world, and the different sphere of influences in our life, starting with those closest to you and extending outwards. Hear what this looks like. Jerusalem will represent your inner circle, your family, closest friends, just as disciples were beginning witnessing in Jerusalem. We are called to start showing love, here and being witnesses of Jesus' love in our close friendships. Application of this, demonstrate love, patience, faithfulness to your family, lead by example, show the fruit of the spirit and helping those closest to you to grow spiritually. Think about this. How are we gonna show love to others when we're not showing love to our immediate family? That doesn't make sense, right? Now, Judea can be compared to a, our slightly wider circle, like our extended family, our church family, our neighborhoods. In this space, we interact with more people, building relationship and serving our community. 
Application of this is volunteering at church, serving your neighbors, offering encouragement and support to our extended family, participate in community building activities that reflect God's love and compassion. Samaria, which is a place historically considered as a place that's culturally and religiously different from Jerusalem, is representing people outside our immediate social our, or belief circle. In our life, this may refer to our colleagues at work, classmates at school, anyone with a different worldview. Application of this is like engage in an open, respectful conversation with people who think or believe differently. Show kindness, understanding, and Christ-like love even when there are differences. Be an ambassador for Christ in these diverse environments. And to the ends of the world, this represents a broader world. This could be seen as our outreach beyond our local boundaries, including global missions, social media influences, or other ways to impact people um, we may never meet personally. How we apply this is like supporting missions, engage in online spaces, share positive messages, and give to causes that promotes justice and love worldwide. Use our influence to spread God's love as far as possible. In conclusion, this progression starting with Jerusalem, which represents our family, and moving outward to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world, illustrates how we can impact the world first by starting at home. Love, faith, and service we show to those closer to us can ripple out into a wider community, workplace, and beyond as we reflect Christ's message in every area of our life. This is all I have. Thank you for your time and any questions or comments.